This podcast is brought to you by Knowledge at Wharton. Welcome to Knowledge at Wharton. I'm Angie Batsuni. Here with me again is Jonah Berger, marketing professor, and today he's going to teach us about how to be a more impactful influencer. He's been doing some co-authored research that looks at how sensory language can help social media marketers drive engagement, connect with their customers more, and hopefully drive sales. Jenna, welcome back. Thanks for having me. So I was reading recently that social media spending uh, on influencers has reached, has passed the $20 billion mark. That is a huge spend for brands. Tell me a little bit about this research and why you wanted to look into it. Yeah. So if we go back in time a little bit, say like about a decade ago, um, uh, I did some conversations with Knowledge of Wharton about that time around the power of word of mouth. I, I, um, my first book, Contagious, was all about kind of word of mouth. How do we get it? How do we get people to talk and share? And at the time, people were still used to sort of a traditional advertising mindset, right? Um, uh, we go on television, uh, a spokesperson or an actor, or just a regular sort of looking person, talks about a product or service, says how great it is. And, and people are starting to realize in kind of the early 2010s, wait, word of mouth is much more impactful than traditional advertising, right? We trust it much more because it feels like it comes from a peer rather than a company, and it can be much more targeted. It can be more likely to reach interested uh, ears. Um, and so companies and organizations, given that sort of revolution and attention of word of mouth, have spent the last kind of decade and a half starting to think about, well, word of mouth is really valuable. How do we get it? Um, and some of that is encouraging their existing customers to talk and share, which is great. But companies used to that traditional advertising model said, well, wait a second, I'm used to paying buying sort of attention for my stuff, is there a way to do that? And, and that really started the influencer boom, right? It's a, in some sense a new type of paid media rather than kind of me designing an ad as a company and going on television or putting it in a magazine. Now I pay a quote unquote influencer, sort of an online individual who has some sort of following to talk about my product, my service and share my message. And so now this $20 billion industry has, has grown up um, where people are talking about products and services and using them to influence others. But importantly, there's a catch, right? Um, influencers are interesting, right? They often have large followings. Uh, people pay attention to them, can raise awareness of products and services, but they have a trust problem. Not everybody trusts influencers because they're not the same as their friends, right? If your friend says, oh my God, I went to this restaurant, it was great. Or a, a colleague in another organization said, I, you know, I tried this software and it worked really well for us. You're more like a listener because you know they didn't get paid. But when someone online that you don't really know so well talks about something or shares a piece of content, you don't know whether they did it because they actually like it or not or just because someone paid them. And so there's this challenge of, hey, lots of money is spent on influencers. Is all that money really well spent? And so that's really where this paper or project started. Hey, lots of companies, organizations are paying lots of individuals to post lots of content. Some of it is impactful, some of it isn't. Why, right? What drives impact? What types of posts from these so-called influencers have more impact? And even more importantly, why? And how about understanding that why? Can we both increase uh, the effectiveness of our spend uh, as well as make our stuff more and more impactful? I think that's what's really interesting about social media influencers is they really do just have this single interface, this medium. And so that makes what they say and how they say it certainly much more important. So let's talk about that sensory language that's at the heart of your paper. What do you mean by sensory language? Give us some examples. Sure. So let's talk about something like a food product. We'll be really simple here, right? Imagine I said, oh, oh my God, I tried this food and it was really good. Right? That would be a, a non-sensory word. It doesn't, doesn't relate to the senses in any way. Alternatively, I could say, hey, I tried that food and it was really tasty, right? Uh, tasty relates to the senses. It speaks to my sensory experience. In this case, my experience of taste, I tasted the food. And I liked the way it tasted. It was tasty. Um, similarly, I could talk about a cream, uh, let's say a, a, a dry skin cream. Um, and I could say, hey, you should put it on your hands, right? And that's not really a sensory word. I could rub it. I talk about rubbing it on your hands. That's a word that relates in some way, shape or form to the senses. And so we can think about our sense of touch, our sense of smell, our sense of taste, uh, our sense of hearing, even our sense of sight. Some words relate to those senses more than others. Unlike a word, uh, just a positive word like good or even great, or there could be negative words also, these sensory words really touch on senses in some way, shape, or form. 
right? Uh, am I rather than putting uh, peanut butter uh, on bread, I could spread it on that bread. Uh, rather than sort of adding uh, flakes on top of something, I could crumble it uh, on top. Um, steak could be really good or it could be really juicy, right? And so all of those latter words, they speak more in this case to a sense of taste or a sense of smell or a sense of touch. And so all those in some way, shape or form relate to sensory experience. And, and that's what makes them sensory language. I, it seems to me like sensory language would be sort of a no brainer. I mean, they've been doing this for a very long time with television commercials, um, radio ads, all that sort of thing. But you're actually, your paper points out that uh, the effect of sensory language on consumer behavior, especially online consumer behavior, has sort of been overlooked in the literature. So what does your paper contribute to this? How do you shed some light on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good observation that um, particularly food marketers have for a long time, I think, recognize, you know, when you show a hamburger, you want to show it looking, you know, plump and, and juicy and all those sorts of things. Um, but I think even traditional sort of advertisers have not always thought about language. There hasn't been amazing research um, that's been done. There's been a little bit of work, but even in advertising, not a lot of work on the exact words we use to describe things, in part because it was tough to study. And in the last um, sort of five, 10 years, there's been a revolution in our ability to extract insight from content. And that's really opened up some exciting uh, work on, on language. And so in this case, um, you know, uh, we tried to begin to say, okay, well, what is the language that influencers use? And different people use different types of language, right? Um, most influencers are not necessarily experts on language. Um, some of them just post content and they try to figure out what works and what doesn't, but they may not always have insight into why. And so we got a large data set of hundreds of different influencers posting thousands of pieces of content across multiple different platforms. And what we did is we began to look at actually the content they were posting. We said, okay, controlling for everything else. So controlling for what topic they're talking about, um, you know, what brand they're working with, how many followers they have, um, their gender, their age, um, what time of day they posted it, the other words they're using. Might this specific type of language, you know, rather than saying uh, food is good, saying it's tasty, for example, um, uh, rather than saying it's great or wonderful, saying it's juicy or fragrant, these language uh, words that subject, just suggest direct experience, might they actually have a, a bigger impact? And in fact, we found that it did. So in a variety of different domains, uh, we found that using sensory language um, rather than this other type of language had an impact, not just a significant impact, but a pretty large one. Um, in uh, TikTok, for example, an additional sensory word, just one additional sensory word in that in that uh, video that people might be making was associated with 11,000 additional likes and, and comments. And so we not only looked at the impact, kind of what does sensory language work? And, and it does. We looked both in the field as well as experimentally. We just manipulated those words and um, asked people to imagine that an influencer was one thing versus something else. We showed a causal impact of that language on behavior. But we also dug into why. Um, and as a, as a scholar of consumer behavior, I always find the why really uh, interesting and important. And my, my co-author, the first author of this paper, Luca, really really did the hard work on this. And, and what he pointed out is, is, look, influencers have a big challenge. I, they're talking about all these products, all these services, but people don't know whether to trust them or not. Um, and even if you say something is good or it's great or it's wonderful or I love it, lots of people say those things. How do I know that I can trust you or not? But sensory language does something quite interesting, right? Um, if it suggests that you've actually had direct experience with that thing, right? If, if you're saying, hey, it's really juicy or really tasty or really fragrant or really smooth, right? Good is a positive adjective, but smooth suggests you've actually felt it, right? I love these cookies. That's really positive, but, you know, they have a, a big crunch when you bite into them. Well, that suggests you much have actually bit into them, right? Anybody can say the cookies are great, whether they've tried them or not. But to actually say they have a crunch, you must have actually experienced it, right? And you can imagine the same thing for other types of experiences, whether it's a, a consumer product or whether it's more of a B2B software backend sort of thing. And so using sensory language suggests direct experience, suggests someone actually tried that product or service they're talking about. And because of that, it makes the speaker seem more authentic, right? It makes them seem like they're, um, I've actually used that shampoo or relied on that software package. I liked it enough to use it enough to use it myself. And so I'm not just recommending because someone paid me, I'm recommending because I actually liked it because I tried it. And wow, if you actually liked it and you tried it, I'm much more likely to listen. 
So just using that sensory language can move the influencer from someone who per is perceived as I'm just getting paid to endorse this product to someone who's actually experienced the product, likes the product, is endorsing it because they believe in it. Exactly. And that's a big challenge here, right? Do I trust this person? And so I use cues just like, right? If you just met someone, you try to figure out, well, do I trust them or not? And it, for influencers, it's particularly difficult because we don't have the most trust for them to begin with. But we use cues like the language they use or the photos they post or other things to make inferences about them. In this case, right, sensory language suggests direct experience. We've done other work on other types of languages or images that speak to similar things, but it's it's all about sort of saying, hey, I'm not just saying this, I actually experienced it. And if I actually experienced it, I'm more authentic and I'm, I'm gonna trust that person. I'm gonna be more likely to buy the product. So what is your big takeaway for marketers or for social media influencers who wanna get better at what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, I think this has both, this, as you very nicely said, sort of direct takeaways for individuals who are themselves influencers or who want to have influence. Many of us may not see ourselves as uh, influencers per se, but we may want to have influence um, uh, more on the, on the folks that listen to us, whether online or off, but also the brands of the organizations that work with these individuals. And I think what's particularly neat here is this is not a big ask, right? We're not asking you to have 10,000 more followers or, you know, drastically overhaul everything you're doing, subtle shifts, really small shifts in the language you're using can have a big impact. As I mentioned, right, one additional sensory word is associated with over 10,000 additional likes and comments on TikTok. And so by understanding what sensory language is and understanding how to work it into to what we've done, uh, what we've posted, what we're sharing, we can have a, a big impact on, on our content's eventual influence. And it doesn't cost anything extra. Doesn't cost anything extra, no. We like that. Thank you, Jarena. His paper is titled, How Sensory Language Shapes Influencers' Impact. You can find it online, along with his many books on powerful, persuasive language. The latest one is called Magic Words, What to Say to Get Your Way. If you enjoyed our conversation, we encourage you to check out all our content at knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu. I'm Angie Bassini. Thanks for joining us. For more insight from Knowledge at Wharton, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu.